Now, this is a part two that's been a long time in the making. Some of you may recall the American Civil War River Ironclads video I did quite a while ago now. Uh, and it was labelled as part one, and a few people have been asking, well, what on earth, Drac, happened to part two? Well, here is part two. A little bit of the way down the line, so apologies for that. However, um, I will emphasise that, obviously, that we are picking up basically from the midpoint of the previous recording we reached a, a nice natural stopping point with the first recording but there's basically about the same amount of time still left to go so if you're thrown into the middle of a discussion with this video that you think hang on a minute um you know what on earth are you guys on about uh there's a link in the description below to the first video where we talk about the river ironclads and other related things, including museum ships, which is what we're going to pick up on discussing initially in this video, and then go on into talking more about the US Navy's ironclads in the American Civil War period and shortly thereafter. So if you want the context, there uh, is the other video. And if you've got really, really good memory, well, uh, la let's launch straight in. Oh, yes, and of course, there are some weird audio artifacts it just happens occasionally with transatlantic calls apologies but i can assure you neither of us are possessed it's just something odd in the audio recording that i can't really get rid of now i wonder i, I wonder how uss kid is doing then i haven't been there in a while no. but it's further up river than uh here in new orleans we did try to have the uss cabot here mm -hmm. and i remember seeing that as uh, when i was a teenager when he'd cross the river you'd see that you know last the independence class escort carriers but we uh, failed to save it, and the whole thing was scrapped. Oops. You know, Oops. even yeah, even while the D-Day Museum was being set up, nothing was done for it, I guess, or not enough was done. So there went the Cabot. That would have been cool, though. We could have our own light carrier here. You could check out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and as you say, to be honest, there's a lot of there's a lot of Essexes still around. Not not a huge number of well, any light or escort carriers. Right. These, they, one of those reasons is because they were decommissioning them during what's called in America the Golden Age of Historic Preservation, mm. which was really jump-started by the destruction of Madison Square Garden, or the construction of Madison Square Garden, the destruction of Penn Station, sorry, that's what I mean, yeah. and also the scrapping of USS Enterprise. Yes, uh, which remains really a, a, almost, a, almost a peacetime war crime, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, uh, still a sore spot to this day, of course, so... I think when people said, like, oh, my God, they destroyed Penn Station, which is beautiful, gorgeous building in New York City, and you've scrapped the Enterprise, um, we have to save things. And so the mm. Essex is commissioned at the moment when Americans were like, save these ships. You know? Yeah. Um, so that makes sense. That really, really helped out. So, yeah, I've been to the uh, Intrepid in New York on that one. I did want to, there was something else I wanted to say about the, yeah, I want to say something about the U.S. fleet, because you, you were joking about how the, the budget got cut after the war. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it very much a classic American thing because of America being founded with a healthy skepticism and fear of professional militaries. You know, I mean, yeah, one of our amendments is a quartering act, which is, you know, you can't have soldiers be quartered in a private residence, for instance. So until you get to post-World War II, and even, 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 a, even in the immediate aftermath of World War II, there was a demobiliz major demobilization the U.S. military thing is we will raise a bunch of soldiers, we will build a bunch of ships, and once this war is over, it's all over. It's, we're, it's, you're going home. It's done. Yeah. You know? Uh, and some of that also is because you're not, not having uh, neighbors that can really challenge you. So the real need for a massive ocean-going fleet, I mean, do you need one? We don't really have an empire. Uh, nobody's really coming for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so... That also, of course, plays a, a major role in um, in uh, the lack of funding after uh, the lack of funding that's going to occur. I did want to ask you though, uh, how would the U.S. Navy at the end of the Civil War stack up compared to the the French, British, um, Austrian, the other large navies of that time? It is a very interesting question because by by sheer hull numbers. The, the U.S. Navy is actually quite the considerable force by the end of the American Civil War. The, the biggest issue that they have, if they're going to sort of try and take on other, other large navies, is actually that 
they're looking at a situation where the vast, vast, vast majority of those ships are either, let's be fair, the ships that were a little bit long in the tooth at the start of the American Civil War and that they just kind of kept in service. A lot of the wooden frigates were in that kind of uh, ballpark. Yeah. Um, a lot of the other stuff is merchant ships taken up out of trade that they've stuck guns on, which obviously they, they count towards the hull numbers, but they're not they're not really warships as such and what what they have of new build stuff especially like the ironclads like um obviously the, the monitors and uss new ironsides are designed primarily for coastal work they have a few larger monitors they're either built or building towards the end of the war that are theoretically ocean capable but that's a very theoretical kind of well if you happen to be brave enough dash suicidal enough you're welcome to try <laughs> um I, so, some of them actually do kind of uh go on various oceanic expeditions and um in some cases end up being relatively useful as small submarine tenders later on but it, it, it's always kind of uh hold your breath and see what happens at one point um after the american civil war one of the larger monitors, I think it might have been off the top of my head, I think it might have been Puritan, uh, it could have been one of the others, actually takes the then Secretary of the Navy over to the UK. And his sort of his narrative back to the States is very triumphalist, kind of, oh, we've shown we've shown the British Navy we can bring our powerful monitors everywhere, everywhere that um that they can go, so they should respect and fear us, etc. And back in the UK, the, re the sort of reaction is a mixture between, well, that's like one of four ships that we are, have actually have any kind of significant firepower that they've got left because this is after the budget cuts. And also mm. a, a sort of a mixture of disappointment and amusement because there were legitimate betting pools being organized by the newspapers as to whether or not the ship would founder in the Atlantic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when it arrived, there were a bunch of bunch of relatively high up uh, um, people in British society who were either disappointed because they had to pay out, or happy that they they'd won a bunch of money on an off on an off bet. <laughs> um, what a great name. USS I mean, USS Puritan. What a great name yeah. for an American ship. <laughs> but um, I, sorry. Uh, another another question I had. Um, Do you have any more to say? Well, I was just going to say the the main thing. With the, with the U.S. fleet, if, if you took the immediacy of Amer after the Civil War, so just before all the budget cuts slash the numbers down, um, the, the main thing is the fact that they are limited in large part to this kind of coastal operation. But it, it's one of the weird things whenever you sometimes see people trying to write alternate histories where um, Britain or France or both get involved in the American Civil War in the by the time you're getting to the late 1860s, both Britain and France have significant fleets of ocean-going large ironclads, and they are by far and away superior to anything the US Navy has on the high seas. But at the same time, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, an awful lot of the immediate US coast is actually very shallow, which... Yeah in any kind of theoretical fight would, would massively limit where a lot of those ironclads could operate. So you'd kind of almost have, in a lot of ways, a staring match because, let's say for sake of example, because it's easier to use the Royal Navy, let's say the British for some reason get involved, maybe the Trent Affair gets especially bad and the public pressure um, forces the British to, to fight the Union for a bit. You'd have this weird kind of scenario where the British will probably still have a bunch of their gunboats left over from the Crimean War, so they'd have they theoretically could bring off across an awful lot of coastal and I guess riverine firepower, but they would be wooden gunboats, so they they'd make a very quick mess of coastal U.S. forces, but that would be in terms of things like frigates and converted ships, but they wouldn't you you can't really do a lot to a, a, a large ironclad. Uh, a monitor if you've got what effectively amounts to to to, to a, a sort of a, a brig or a sloop that happens to have a few mortars and a, and a couple of field guns strapped to it um 
but the, the big stuff, the ships of the line and the, and the big ironclads, they're going to be kind of sitting in the deeper water where they can maneuver and where they can use their speed and endurance. And the, the monitors are going to be sitting in the more protected shallower coastal waters where they have the advantage of well, being able to navigate period and are not quite at the same risk of storms that they would be out in the high seas. And assuming that both sides have vaguely competent admirals, they're not actually going to really be pressing at each other because if, if the British ships close in, they're sacrificing their agility and their superior range. And if the American ships come out, then they're kind of they, they're almost going to be fighting the high seas as much as they are the British. And the British at that point, with open water to maneuver in, they're just going to sail rings around them because the monitors are many things, but fast they are not. <laughs> uh, the, pretty much the only time you're going to see any kind of major confrontation would be if if the British decide to go for some kind of major harbor assault. Mm -hmm. But by the time you're getting towards the end of the 1860s, which would be post American Civil, immediately post American Civil War, the British have actually taken a lot of lessons from what the the US has been doing in the Civil War, and they're building their own series of of monitors or monitor like ships, for which which they use a lot for harbor protection and colonial protection and such. Um, although obviously it's on a little bit of a it's a bit weird because they're on a little bit of a learning curve behind the US in terms of hull numbers and such, but the ships that they're producing in a lot of ways are scaled down oceanic ironclads rather than the the purely dedicated coastal monitors that the, the US is building. So you you have this weird and weird situation where the, the British are building monitors that are relatively speaking a happily able to cruise around the world because they've got to physically get to these colonial locations, which makes them a bit larger and a bit more powerful on paper. But equally, because they are that little bit larger, they tend to have a superstructure, which would make them a bit of an easier target and also a slightly deeper draft, which means that whilst they're a lot more capable of coastal work than the big uh, oceanic ironclads are, there's still going to be places where the especially shallow draft US monitors can go that they can't. Mm. Um, and also, the, the US technologically is a little bit behind um, the, the British and the French in the 1860s. So at the beginning of 1862, 1863, the British are using steel shot for their guns. The Americans are still using cast iron, and obviously steel shot has greater penetrative capabilities. Um, when HMS Warrior is built in 1860, they are using single thickness, four and a half inch plate, which at the time the American foundries physically can't make, uh, which is one of wow. the reasons why um, Monitor has basically loads of one inch plates all riveted together, um, which make up a much bigger thickness. Of what Monitor has, I think, eight inches of armor in places. But it's not. It might be eight inches thick, but it's not actually the equivalent of an eight-inch solid plate because laminated multiple plates are actually very ineffective, um, and they they kind of lose a lot of their effectiveness past the first plate. Um, the they do through the Civil War eventually develop the ability to to make plates of this kind of four and a half inch thickness, which is why you things, see things like USS New Ironsides, uh, but the mm -hmm. quality is still behind in a lot of ways up until uh, a, a good a good period after the American Civil War. Um, the American Civil War kind of kickstarts American industry along those lines of improving their metallurgy and their capacity. Uh, but it is, it is playing a bit of a catch-up game for quite a while um, thereafter. The other thing is you actually see this in terms of the guns as well, because... Uh, well, as you probably are aware, immediately pre-American Civil War, you have this incident, I think it's on the Princeton, or something beginning with P, where you have all these high-ranking um, officials here to, to witness a new gun being fired, and the thing just blows yeah. up. <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, President Tyler's administration. Yeah. yeah I'm a reader of that, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, gu the gun just detonates because it's been not the quality control for making those kind of high pressure weapons just isn't there. Um, mm. And 
in the U places like the UK and France, they do have that technology. So when you're looking at um, British and French guns at the time, so let's say take Warrior, because Warrior is 1860, so it's kind of just about the start of the American Civil War kind of time period. But the six, they've got it's got 68-pounder and 110-pounder guns. Now, the 110-pounder has some issues because it's an early breech loader and the breech doesn't quite seal properly. Um, but it's still a relative decent weapon. The 68-pounder is a very good weapon and equipped with steel shot and, and the latest British powder. It actually has quite a hefty chunk of armor-piercing capability, but as you might be able to tell from the shot weights, they're not that large a weapon mm -hmm. because they're able to fit that much power into a small gun, whereas in the US, with incidents like that in mind, they're not able to produce a small, high-power, high-velocity armor-piercing weapon. And this is why you see things like the Columbiads and the Dahlgren guns, which are effectively... They're the naval equivalent of gargantuan shotguns. They're, yeah. they're low-velocity specifically because they don't want to pack in the charges to make them high-velocity because they're worried they'll explode. Um but they make up for that by just being massive. So they're firing sort of eventually 11 inch, 15 inch, and later on with some prototypes, even larger sh shells and shot. And they're kind of they're getting their a lot of their kinetic energy from just smashing through things, um, which is is fine for use in the American Civil War, where you've got all sorts of weird and wonderful efforts to make armor like a <laughs> railway lines so, and that have been taken up and stuff like that um yeah. especially where you've got stuff like laminated and and layered plate because this kind of smashing effect dislodges rivets and knocks bits apart which you can exploit with further shots but it's also a reflection of the fact that they're not actually able to make these high velocity weapons they they, they get they, they get on with it and you get things like the parrot rifles and the brooks rifles uh, which come along, which are relatively high velocity weapons, but you can see from the overall muzzle velocity and the size, they're, they're still kind of banking a little bit on shot size at the expense of some muzzle velocity. Um, but compared to something like a Dahlgren, um, they're still relatively high, high speed weapons. Um, the Dahlgrens, weirdly enough, actually turn out to be relatively decent medium scale weapons as well, um, medium velocity weapons as well, because Dahlgren is so paranoid about his guns exploding that he overbuilds them to such a degree that they actually turn out to be capable of taking much larger charges than he thought. Um, mm. And this is why you get one of the one of the more common myths about, say, the Battle of Hampton Roads is people say, "Oh, well, like Monitor could have defeated Virginia if it had been using full charges in its guns," and they go on about, "Oh, it was using half charges." And it's not actually the case. What's the case is that when the, those 11-inch Dahlgrens were manufactured very shortly before, Dahlgren had issued guidelines that said these are the maximum charges you can use with these 11-inch guns. Um, hmm. And the US Navy, or the I guess the Union Navy at that point, was kind of like, okay, given what's happened every other time we've tried high high amounts of charge in a gun, this is probably a good idea. So Monitor goes in using what, for the time, are full charges in its guns. It turns out after the fact, uh, a few months after that battle, that Dahlgren's looking at his guns and very gingerly increasing the amount of charge and finding that they can actually take significantly more. And so he over I think about two or three different revisions gradually tells the US Navy you can use this charge which is heavier and it's getting larger and larger so I think by the end of the war the 11 inch Dahlgren's able to take like 2.25 to two and a half times the charge that it was being used with at Hampton Roads albeit with uh, the biggest list of safety disclaimers that you're likely to see in a Victorian era um <laughs> <laughs> Victorian era piece of, uh, of literature, given that like safety, what is that? Was pretty much the the the, the, the paradigm for a lot of that period. Uh, Dahlgren is very, very kind of well. Yes, you can use it, but the temperature has to be right, and uh, it has to be a new gun. And if if absolutely anything at all is out of the ordinary, like stop immediately and go down to this lower charge because he does not want to be sued. <laughs> Um, especially if you can imagine that what happens if you overcharge a 15-inch Dahlgren and it explodes inside a monitor's turret. There's not going to be an awful oh. lot left. 
But it makes perfect sense. I mean, well, it also makes sense Dahlgren's personality based on what I've read about his actions at Charleston in 1863. But there's a similar thing in the uh, the Union Army with that as well, hmm. because you have the parrot rifle. Uh, the parrot rifle uh, artillery piece is very good. I would say slightly better the ordnance, the three inch ordnance rifle. But the three inch ordnance rifle is just more reliable. It doesn't exp- hmm. doesn't have as many misfires or explosions. Another example of that is the Colt revolving rifle. Uh, that could put out a lot of lead. Yeah, but it's it fouls up it has a tendency to blow up. So you got to prefer something like say the Spencer, which is just about not as good, but almost as good and just mm-hmm. a lot more reliable. Uh, that's kind of a I think some of it also comes to the fact that in the U.S. Civil War they you had this small army and navy that suddenly has to expand quickly for yeah. both sides, yeah. and that means that you have pieces of equipment that vary all over the place. Like there are in the early war, some union regiments are running around with Napoleonic era Prussian muskets that they bought in excess. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, um, yeah guys, I mean, you guys run around with like flintlocks in the American revolution in some of the Confederate units, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, I mean, now as the war goes on, of course, things get a bit more standardized, but especially early in the war, Quality and type of weapon is just all over the place. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I think the the U.S. Navy immediately post-American Civil War is one of these. It's one of several of what I would call big missed opportunities for the U.S. Navy because Congress, to be honest, actually, I wouldn't even say until World War II. I'd say probably up, up, up until the Korean War has this habit, as I'm sure you're aware of, of cutting fun- military funding to the absolute bone until yeah. the next war and then suddenly they panic and dump massive amounts of money on everything and I, I, I've actually noticed reading up a bit on the Korean War even there, they're almost in the same situation, they've built up this absolutely colossal fleet in World War II as well as an Air Force and Army, but it's been so massively cut back even in four or five years up until the Korean War they're kind of throwing pretty much everything they've got in the Western Pacific at Korea. And even with various, uh, at the time, UN allies, they're still very much on the back foot um, once China gets involved. And China, at this point, is not exactly a, a, a world-leading military. And I think it's the Korean War that kind of then you kickstarts the the single longest continuous period where the U.S., armed forces have actually got relatively consistent and relatively large amounts of funding yeah um, that it's it's an outgrowth of the korean war um i uh, i you know did cold war studies years back and uh, my professor made an argument that the most important event of the cold war really is the korean war because before hmm. that the u.s military while it was larger than it had ever been post-war so hmm. it still had major cutbacks and he said since then it has never been cut back. I believe the document that laid that out was NSC 68, I want to say it was. Mm-hmm. A national security document where they essentially yeah. said this is what we're going to do now and we are going to constantly have this massive, uh, well-funded military. But yeah, there's, there was always this thing, wars over, cut to the bone. In fact, if anything, <laughs> post-World War II, we were keeping up a large force compared to what we had done after any other previous conflict. Without a doubt. Yeah. I'm really I'm really glad you went into those details about the British Navy because and about the capabilities because hmm. there's this um a lot of American Civil War historians don't know that the other countries in the world exist and are doing things. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, like when I was a kid, they they'd be like, the Virginia was the first ironclad, and then you know, like you know, you read more books, and then you're like, No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. Are other ships, like, you know, and or things like you know, the Civil War is the first modern war. And I'm like, nope, nope, definitely not. In fact, most of the advancements <laughs> that they say were the first in the Civil War were already using the Crimean War. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and I'm not trying to say that the Civil War didn't have its share of innovation, but I'm definitely mm. in the school that says that it had more in common with the Napoleonic Wars than it had with World War One. Yeah, um, well, I, th- I think this is the thing. It's it's the, the big contrast, and the reason why I think the American Civil War is one of the big missed opportunities for the U.S. fleet is the when you start the American Civil War, the U.S. Navy has a handful of, in many cases, somewhat dodgily designed steam frigates. Yeah. Um, and that's really it. Everything else they've got is kind of 
either sailing frigates that wouldn't look terribly out of place in the War of 1812 and a bunch of rather questionably designed ships of the line that they built in the interim that have they've kind of just popped into various ports because they don't have the, the money or the men to man them. That They don't have anything on the horizon in terms of an ironclad fleet, despite Britain and France having kicked off an ironclad building war uh, kind of a couple of years earlier. And as I said, they're, they're having problems even just making high-velocity guns that won't blow up their own ships. But by the end of the war, they've got these massive smashing guns. They've got a, a good a good lead on on building fairly powerful high velocity weapons. They've got an awful lot of combat experience. And whilst okay, even USS New Ironsides isn't the world's greatest seagoing ship, they've got an awful lot of experience in building and equipping ironclads. So they're actually in a very good position to exploit mm. all of that into kind of a jumping off point where they could start to make oceanic ironclads if they wanted to especially given the sheer amount of ironclad building industry that had been built up even with all the cut if they cut everything back they can at least sort of concentrate rather than having say half a dozen monitors in one area you can have one really big nice ironclad but they're not able to to do that because of the budget cuts and then when you see them being sort of building up again in the 1890s when somebody helpfully points out that a Brazilian ironclad is docked in New York Harbor. And if the Brazilians of all people decided to go to war with the U S at that point, there's literally nothing they can do to stop it. Um, <laughs> then you, you start building up, which this, this new fleet, which turns out to be very, very useful in the Spanish American war. But in a lot of ways, the obviously America wins the Spanish American war very decisively, but does so largely on the basis of they're not as terrible as the Spanish, which is not exactly <laughs> a high bar to clear, considering that the Spanish are like, we have an armoured cruiser, but we don't have its main guns because we decided we don't like them. And uh, <laughs> and our ammunition is mostly full of sawdust because either we can't afford the gunpowder or with the few gunpowder shell filled shells we did have, people drained the gunpowder and sold it off for in <laughs> to, to fight, fund their wine campaign or something. Um, and, and I do have one. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. No, my bad. Go ahead. I was going to say, and of course, you've got things like the, the Indiana class, which kind mm. of, apart from the, the original USS Iowa BB4, uh, the Indiana class are kind of the US's first attempt at an ocean going warship, pre dreadnought warship. And they have this worrying tendency of almost rolling over whenever they, ro whenever they turn their guns um, oh. to port or starboard because it's a bit it's 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 very sad in that the you've these three indiana class semi-coastal semi-oceanic pre-dreadnoughts are all that's left after the u.s navy put forward a plan to for about 40 or 50 battleships including some really nicely designed ocean going ones and congress eventually told them they could have three instead of 40 and they weren't allowed any of the big ones so they tried to basically because they, they had this they had a three-tier design of really big oceanic pre-dreadnoughts um sort of coastal pre-dreadnoughts and then at the at the lowest tier sort of riverine only pre-dreadnoughts mm -hmm. and the indiana class was kind of an attempt because they weren't allowed to have the biggest ones they tried kind of tried to take roughly the whole of the coastal ones and cram the armament of the big oceanic ones on them. And it turned out that the the width of the hull wasn't actually enough to have a centered, balanced um, gun turret. So you had these twin 13-inch guns, but they didn't have a center of gravity over the middle of the ship. So whenever you rotated them left or right, their center of gravity was now significantly now to port or starboard. And because these ships hulls were relatively small uh, sort of only a, i think six eight thousand tons um suddenly having several hundred tons of gun on effectively on one side of the ship and not the other meant the whole ship kind of healed over quite oh, significantly God. which was very bad because it then meant that the belt armor was now below the water line so anything not only could they not shoot as far because now obviously the guns were elevating mostly just to get back to zero rather than actually shoot any considerable distance, but any incoming shells would just punch straight through the unarmored portions of the upper hull, which were now the water line. And then when the flooding started, they the ships had a pre-built built-in list. Um, so it was all 
it was pretty awful but the um as it turned out the spanish literally couldn't hit the side of a barn door if you put them inside the barn in the first place so it didn't matter too much <laughs> Yeah, that remind, that remind me of those uh, Japanese ships in the 1930s that were, you know, they're trying to you know, cram too much into the design with the Megami yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. I, I, what, I did want to ask you this, though, mm -hmm. because, you know, connecting the thing I mentioned about the U.S. Navy, because, you know, the I'm not saying the Civil War, of course, didn't have its share of unique features and effects on warfare. I'm just saying that in America, it's usually overplayed. Mm -hmm. And I mention that because what... What lessons were people, were the other navies, did the other navies draw from the American Civil War, if any? Because you said the British took yeah. some interest in it. I'm just yeah. curious if anybody was really paying a lot of attention, and, and, if, and if they were, what were they noticing? The biggest things that they were taking away from it, um, it depended on the nation in a lot of ways. Um, the, the British were looking mostly at as I say, monitors as coastal defense units, and even to a certain degree in the river areas. Um, not so much monitors, but the the gunboats and such that were used in the Riverine War. And they were kind of going, hmm, aha, uh -huh, a way to exert naval power much closer into the coastline and then upriver than we'd previously thought. Um, so that was how they took it away, because I suppose they're, they're looking at it from a perspective of maintaining and enforcing their authority within an empire. So those are the most useful aspects. Of, of the American Civil War's sort of learnings, I guess. And they take that part away. Um, a lot of European powers actually look quite closely at the river warfare and the coastal warfare with monitors. And because they, they've, you've got sort of big rivers like the Danube and the Rhine and the Volga in Europe. And a lot of the European nations have historically shied away from having riverine forces because obviously Europe being quite small and compact and the rivers not being quite the size of something like the Mississippi, even though the Danube is pretty large. They kind of look at them and go, oh, the pre whereas previously they've, they, as I say, they've shied away from river naval forces because like you sail 20 miles, you'll come across a fort or a gun battery and a small wooden river warship will then just be shot to bits. Um, mm -hmm. And they go, ah, there, there is now a way to have a ship that can be on the river, but also survive against land-based firepower. And so there's a whole rash of, in the late 1860s and 1870s, um, lots of Europe European powers building a lot of river-based river ironclads. The Austro-Hungarian Navy builds quite a few, for example. Um, I've actually visited one that they've restored in, in Budapest in Hungary. Um, so that comes out of the American Civil War as a direct influence. And actually, in that museum, there's a, there's a whole section dedicated to basically this is where the Austro-Hungarian Empire got the idea. And it's a massive section on um, sort of USS Monitor and various um, river-based monitors as well. Um, I'd heard that about uh, I'd heard that about Austria, mm. and I, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't the the uh, river ships the first ones to shell? Uh, I want to say like were some of the first things to shell Serbia during World War One, like the, and there were some of the opening shots of the war. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah, exactly that, yeah, because it we uh, this is the thing. It's like although Europe is relatively small, it's incredibly varied in terrain. Um, and so th this has always been one of the biggest problems with any kind of land-based warfare in Europe, which I think is why Europe's divided up into so many small countries, in that if your enemy fortifies, there are a lot of places to fortify. They're, relative, like, they're relatively close to each other, so they can also be sort of mutually supporting in certain ways. And good luck hauling anything large over any considerable distance. Um, so you... you, you you can have sieges, but a lot of European sieges all the way from the medieval period through to sort of the Franco-Prussian War, they tend to be we're starving them out and occasionally shooting at them because if up and pretty much up until the advent of railways, the idea of bringing up a massive siege train with enough artillery to just blast your way through is pretty much a non-starter. You you do get occasional periods of when our guns are first developed and whenever there's a sort of a resurgence in some new form of transport but generally speaking it's very difficult to bring enough of a siege train to bear in europe to demolish a fortress um 
unless you're there for ages and ages and ages. Whereas once the monitors take off, uh, the European navies are looking at it going, aha, well, now here is a way to actually bring kind of your big heavy artillery right up to the enemy's fortifications. Okay. Um, and I think the, the other thing, and this is a, a particularly French thing, although it does take a little while to develop within within the schools of French thought, is that you have they, they look at they're looking more at the Confederate Navy than the Union Navy because they're, yes. they're, they're in a position of being the, the smaller Navy to, compared to the British and the list, slightly less technologically advanced. Which is weird because the French keep making the like odd technological advances here and there. Like they bring out the first ironclad. Um, they're the first ones to develop steel armor, um, and then the Americans go and invent Harvey Steel, which is much better. But there you go. Um, they keep coming up with these odd technical advances, and then the British kind of just go, "Oh yes, that's very nice. We shall replicate this, and we shall add all of our own technological advances, and we shall build like twelve dozen of them." And then the, the French just go away very sad, <laughs> having having thought they had supremacy for about a year, and then the British come up with the same thing but better and in mass numbers. And so, because, uh, I'm so good. My bad. No, I was going to say because of this, they're looking at the Confederacy, and one thing they realize is that Confederate raiders, like obviously famously CSS Alabama, they force the Union to commission vast amounts of warships um, just to protect their trade, and they're looking at this and going, "Well, if you look at the balance of power, okay, fine, the Confederates lost, but look at." how few raiders the Confederacy actually put out compared to how much effort the U Union Navy had to put in to stop them. Um, and even then, it took quite a while to hunt down a lot of them. And they, they look at it and go, ah, well, perhaps this is a way to dilute the British uh, sea power if we build, because obviously they've got more industry than the Confederacy. They think, oh, if we build a relatively large number of small, fast, but well-armed commerce raiders this will force the british fleet to be dispersed across the planet trying to stop them all and then that will reduce main british fleet strength at home to a point that perhaps we can win and then along comes the torpedo and they think they can win even cheaper with torpedo boats yeah the um there's two things to mention with that one um of course what you're saying is you know i i guess what the what the french might be thinking is that i mean you know the idea of raiding commerce at is pretty common before, of course, but mm. maybe SS Alabama and the Shenandoah and the other ones were exceptionally successful. I think Alabama sank, what, 77 ships or something ridiculous? But you mentioned the ones about them looking at the Confederates. I was doing my research for my Beauregard book. Beauregard was a big fan of uh, Napoleon III, and he met Napoleon III. And Napoleon III specifically is talking to Beauregard mostly to get information about submarines and torpedo boats that the mm -hmm. Confederates had developed. Uh, because Beauregard was a big advocate of uh, light coastal torpedo boats, submarines, and whatnot. I mean, he, Beauregard's the one who really champions the Hunley, for instance. Mm -hmm. And there's also CSS David and a few other ones. So I, I, I wasn't specifically asking about that one because uh, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, <laughs> Beauregard, fun yeah. fact, did think about going to France to serve as a general in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, but he, uh, he, he'd always have these fanciful ideas like, oh, I'll serve in the Japanese army or I'll go serve mm. in the Egyptian army. And then he'd go like, ah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll just stay. To be, to be honest, <laughs> he, he, he probably could have had a decent career if he'd wanted to. Um, it, it's often joked that uh, from the most of the latter part of the 19th century, uh, most of the wars are actually, are actually kind of proxy wars fought by Britain against Britain, um, even when Britain technically has nothing to do with it, because you have so many Royal Navy officers um, on half pay uh, and such. Like, I mean, it, it kind of starts off in the immediate Napoleon, post-Napoleonic era, but it carries through throughout most of the 19th century. You have all yeah. these odd British officers who are like, they're on half pay because there's so many of them. The Admiralty's trying to sort of shuffle them around and put people on sort of semi-retirement for a few years to let other officers have a chance. And so they go wandering off with all these ideas about how to fight and what ships to use, etc. And they get snapped up by all these smaller countries who then end up having 
wars with other small countries and it turns out that you have like a small cadre of british officers on one hand advising one nation and a small cadre of british officers on the other nation advising them and they end up kind of fighting each other but also oh, yeah. you have a lot of weird instances where you'd have like two ships show up and start fighting each other and then halfway through when it looks like uh, one's got the other upper hand the other one as soon as it realizes it's losing will instantly surrender and the other side will accept the surrender because they don't actually want to kill each other because they're usually good friends and it's like oh hello yeah, fancy meeting you here kind of thing um oh which, yeah i mean the uh, the Egyptian army had Union and Confederate generals <laughs> serving mm. as their main commanders. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think the the, the one of the, what's it, the Battle of Campeche or Campeche, something like that. So I think it's Mexico versus Texas. Um, it, it, that takes place in kind of the middle of the eighteen of the the middle of the eighteen hundreds, um, and it, it's literally like the Texan Navy and the Mexican Navy are both both have elements of the Royal Navy aboard. Um, and so some of the other navies towards the end of the 19th century tried to get in on the action as well, but never quite to the same extent. Um, so you, you end, I think this, this is one of the things, one of the reasons why, weirdly enough, it means towards the end of the 19th century, the British Navy actually has a significant amount of incidental combat experience, but it's very colonial. Yeah. Which, weirdly enough, when when you end up with the colo the colonial side of World War One, actually benefits the Royal Navy quite a lot because there's uh, sort of this cadre of officers who are now relatively senior who have a relatively decent idea about how to do ad hoc forces and concentrate concentration of ships to hunt down raiders and such, which is one of the reasons outside of things like the Battle of Coronel, that the German fleet overseas disappears pretty quickly in most cases. Mm. But at the same time, it actually has an overall, I think, detrimental effect on the, the Grand Fleet at home because you have so many of these officers floating around who are just like, oh, yes, well, when I was over fighting um in the indian ocean i did this and someone else going yeah yes but when i was fighting for the chilean navy i did that and the higher echelons of the royal navy are just like no 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 we we can't have all these mutually competing ideas because the navy's the, the fleet's going to go in six different directions with 19 different tactics and everything's going to go horribly wrong so they end up imposing an incredibly top down hierarchical chain of command where it's like the the admiral says do this you will do this and you will do nothing else or else wow, okay um because precisely because they're worried of everyone running all off all over the place um and that actually comes to bite the royal navy quite badly at things like jutland where a little bit of free thinking probably would have gone a long way <laughs> um mm. and um, the thing is to be honest on the one hand a little bit more initiative would have probably secured the Royal Navy a very decisive victory at Jutland. On the other hand, Admiral Beatty pretty much comes up through this, he, although he doesn't serve in overseas navies, he does serve very much in the kind of colonial, more free-thinking um, elements of the Navy pre-war, and then using his political connections sort of rams his way up through the ranks. And you see exactly what how that kind of thinking works out for him at Jutland. Um, yes. So it's kind of uh, it, it, it's 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 definitely not you would have wanted to keep that entire way of thinking going, but the fact they clamp down on it so hard and go the other way is actually probably an overall negative. The weird thing is though that the um, the budget cuts that the U.S. Navy undergoes in the early twentieth century, weirdly enough, they they kind of work for it. When it comes to World War Two, they're just very lucky they didn't have to fight anybody seriously at sea in World War One, because mm. they end up in this situation where Congress is giving them only a limited amount of funding. So, they the U.S. Navy kind of goes, "Well, what can we afford? Not a lot. What do we need to maintain ourselves as a serious navy, having sort of established that with a great white fleet and everything?" 
and they eventually come to the conclusion that they can continue to construct battleships, which are kind of the, the key centerpiece, and practically nothing else. So although the US Navy would dearly like cruisers and destroyers and, and battle cruisers, and they keep doing studies for them, they basically don't get any um, sort of post the building of HMS Dreadnought until sort of 1916, 1917, when suddenly they start to build Clemson and Wix class like it's going out of fashion. But it means they they kind of skip an entire developmental era in cruiser and destroyer warfare. Hmm. So in the post-World War One environment, when you've got the Treaty Era and everyone's building sort of Treaty Era cruisers. Everybody else is stuck with a relatively large fleet of pre-treaty cruisers that they've invested a fair amount of money into, and in some cases are fairly new, and so they have to maintain them because it's just not going to make economic sense to scrap them after like two, three years in service. But that means that with, the, say, the Royal Navy, they end up with the C-Class, the D-Class, and the E-Class, and the Hawkins class hanging around all the way through into World War II, even though by that point having kind of uh, six, 7,000 ton light cruisers with multiple single guns, including many scattered down the wings, really isn't competitive. Um, and mm -hmm. they're, they're turning some of the older ones into anti-aircraft cruisers by that point. Whereas the US Navy, it goes into the treaty era with pretty much the Omaha class, and that's it as far as viable combat units go. And the Omaha class, to be honest, they're kind of like the early 1920s version of the Atlanta class. They're not, they're not really cruisers. They're more kind of overblown destroyers. Yeah. But it means that the US Navy, when it's building its cruiser tonnage, they can pretty much start from a clean slate. So they, they start out with the Pensacolas, and then you have the Northamptons and the Portlands and the New Orleans class. And so when they enter... And then obviously you'll see things like the Brooklyns. So they enter World War II with a cruiser fleet that is no more than maybe 15 years old, which is a huge, and a lot of it is quite heavy. That's all 10,000 ton units, which is a huge advantage for them compared to the British, who they've got their counties and the towns, but they've also got this raft of older ships um, that are not, not as capable. And the Japanese. Although they're not caught in quite the same situation as the British, because they hadn't, they didn't have to do a massive war build in World War One, they still have a bunch of somewhat obsolete early 1920s designs that are nowhere near as powerful as as a lot of the U.S. ships. Um, which, although they managed to use them to great effect in the early part of the war with things like Savo Island, once the U.S. cruiser forces get their act together a bit. And especially in terms of when you're talking about air power and having to retrofit massive AA batteries onto ships, these vessels, they don't have the anti-surface firepower once the US cruisers can shoot straight, and they definitely don't have anywhere near the deck space for a decent anti-aircraft battery, and so they get utterly victimized by sort of 1943 when the US carrier fleets and cruiser fleets are showing up in larger and larger numbers. I never thought about that with the uh, with the U.S. cruisers, but you know, you say it; it makes perfect sense because I did the research for the game across four oceans. Of course, mm. I'm doing the British. I'm like, oh, look at these old, lots of old cruisers. You know, but I guess the reason I didn't think of that was since the Portland, not, not sorry, not the Portland, the Pensacola class wasn't particularly good. <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, I had trouble getting wet and whatnot. Uh, God, I read somewhere the uh, they almost sold it off to Sweden at one point. Mm. Or the Swedes were interested, but anyway. So and I didn't think of that, but you're you're uh, that that's actually right. Yeah, they 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 were building. They mostly had more modern or at least new cruisers, if you will, with considerable gunpowder, even though they lacked torpedoes. But still, um, I did before I uh, before I had to go. I did mm -hmm. want to ask you one other question, and I had one to mention a few things of what I think the legacy of the river warfare was after yeah. the war. Yeah. But one question I had real quick. Because I'm skeptical mm -hmm. of those Civil War claims, they're like, you know, like, oh, they're the first war of photography. I'm like, no, no, the Crimean mm -hmm. War. But anyway, yeah. is the CSS Alabama the most successful surface raider in history? I've seen that claim made before. 
I know it sank roughly 77 ships, uh, maybe give or take mm. a few on that one. Is that the most successful in terms of just number of ships sunk by a surface raider? It depends how you, it depends how far back you go and how okay. you count things. Right. Uh, it, you can make a technical argument for uh, Alabama as uh, uh, the most successful surface raider. And if, and if someone said, is it one of the most successful? I'd say very definitely. Um, the thing is, is exactly how you measure it. Because if you, if you measure it by holes, that's one thing. But you could also measure it. Yeah, the, yeah. The thing you <laughs> yeah. could measure it by tonnage. Oh, um, not by tonnage. <laughs> you could you could also measure it by um, sort of time spent at sea, like how long did it take for the enemy to hunt them down. Uh, um, yes. You could, you could measure it by effect on the enemy, like how much effort did they have to put into hunting down this one particular uh, raider, and how long did it take after they actually started doing that to to get it. Um, you can look at. Uh, you can also look at things like return on investment, like how much did it cost to to buy to buy and outfit that ship versus how much did it cost the enemy in terms of lost vessels and um, the cost of operations to to run it down. Um, and in in that so those circumstances, sometimes you can end up with some really surprising ships popping up to the top of the list because you can get some really tiny ones that obviously they cost nothing um, and almost almost by capturing a single vessel, they've almost doubled their rate of return. Um, but the other thing, to be honest, is that it, it, uh, you have to draw a line somewhere as to at what point in history are we going back to? Because gotcha. if you if you go back to the Napoleonic era, if you include that classic age of sail period, most successful surface raider, it's going to be some British frigate from the Napoleonic Wars. Because obviously, let's... It, it's not even particularly, particularly because it's British or Royal Navy. It's simply just because the Napoleonic Wars last for so long. Um, they're kind of a, almost a, an extension of various on and off. I think, to be honest, once you have the American War of Independence and there's a big blow up where everybody fights everybody then, the, the Seven Years' War, then there's a, a peace period. But then pretty much after that, um, after that period of peace, there's another blow up with the France as a monarchy. And then you have the revolutionary period where the revolutionaries decide they want to stay at war with Britain anyway. And then you have the Napoleonic period, which rolls directly on from that, where Napoleon decides he wants to stay at war with Britain anyway. So you have this sort of 25 to 30 year ongoing war with the occasional break. Um, oh, yeah. And obviously, with the extended cruising times that you get with having sail powered warships. And the, the, just the sheer lifespan of, again, of sail-powered wooden warships. There are some British frigates that just rack up absolutely ridiculous capture rates because they're just going around for 15, 20 years, just constantly taking and retaking, in some cases, uh, French, Spanish, uh, French and Spanish ships. I mean, it kind of helps that at points Britain's at war with basically everybody who has a large merchant or actual navy. Um, uh, <laughs> so around about the time of actually the War of 1812 is kind of the, the, the high point of that for British ships because it's like, okay, well, who has a significant merchant navy? Uh, the Danish, the Dutch, the Spanish, the French, and the Americans, oh, look, we're at war with literally all of them. Um, so it's a target-rich environment for British frigates. They're sailing around. It's like, does the, is this ship flying a British flag? No, in which, or a Portuguese one for some bizarre reason. Um, it, if, if the answer is no, we take it. And they, they just rack up stupid amounts of, of seizure rates. And it, especially when you consider something like, around about that time, you can have anything down to like a 30, 40-ton brig randomly wandering around so you, you you might come across like a small a small convoy of brigs or sloops the combined tonnage of which is probably half that of your own ship but you might come away with 15 captures or something stupid because Damn. everyone sees this big frigate coming and they're just like yeah we don't want to get sunk in one shot so we're all going to surrender <laughs> um yeah you know you mentioned that one about the about the wars going on i i like mm. the term for the period from 1792 to 1815 there's only two periods of peace in there and they have a term for it the the great french war which makes a lot of sense but god the i think that i think the 17 into the early 1800s the only one of those wars where britain and france 
are on the same side as the War of the Quadruple Alliance, which only lasts about two years. Yeah. That's it. Otherwise, it's like Spanish succession, Austrian succession, Seven Years' War, American Revolution, Great French War. They're always, they're always opposed. Oh, yeah. War of the Great Alliance, if you're going back even further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, the British have, well, I think the, the funny thing, I don't know if you've ever seen it, that there's a comedy series called Yes Minister in the UK. Or uh, my, dad was a big fan, uh, my dad was a big fan of that. So yeah. I actually had the DVD lying around here somewhere. Yeah, it, it, it's, an, it's an excellent... The funny thing is, it's an excellent comedy program, but it actually contains such a ridiculous amount of truth about both how the British government ran then, how it's run historically, and how it runs now. Um, <laughs> because I, I think one of the best phrases I've ever come up with after watching that is, which, to be honest, it generally bears through most of British history, is that Britain is, was never a successful country because of its government. Britain was a successful country in spite of its government. <laughs> uh, it's like ev every single time the government has ever tried to do anything other than sit back and let the military do its thing when it comes to war, everything has always gone horribly wrong. Um, I mean, e to be honest, even the American War of Independence is like that. Because um, yeah. you're probably aware, like, the, 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 the swings and roundabouts of the fortunes in that, in that in period... And to be honest, most oh, yeah. yeah, most of the success. I mean, the fact that the war even happens, okay. To be honest, in a large part, is because of some very wealthy Americans who really don't like paying their taxes. Which that's um, part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like if you want to be uncharitable, I sometimes, I sometimes say, to, if I want to be uncharitable, you could say America is a country founded on tax evasion, and they have never really stopped, um, <laughs> especially in the upper echelons of things, but. But um, yeah, so it's part of it. But a lot of the antagonism that comes about is you see a lot of correspondence in the in the build up to the American uh, War of Independence and in the immediate um, breakout of the war, where a lot of British officers are writing back to the UK and saying this is possibly the single worst way to go about dealing with the colonists. But the British government, it kind of acting out of a sense of wounded pride. The politicians going, oh, no, but we must impose our authority and we must do it in this manner. And a lot of uh, sort of colonels and generals and admirals writing back going, OK, yes, we get the idea of you need to impose your authority, but you should do it in this way, because this way we won't tick off literally everybody. Um, <laughs> um, and they're not listened to. And then, and then by the time that like the actual war breaks out, then then the, then the British government thinks the next big idea is is to go and annoy, keep continue annoying the French and the Spanish to the point that the French and the Spanish take the opportunity to declare war on them, which pretty much turns the tables because up until that point, the the, the revolutionaries are losing, running out of money. Um, yes, gunpowder. Yeah, gunpowder, pretty much everything. They're very low in morale. And then the French get involved, and suddenly the British can't maintain a stranglehold on the American East Coast. And now they're now having to draw away a lot of men and ships to fight the French. And the French are sending men and supplies and <laughs> and everything to the Americans. And then they end up losing the colonies. Um, it's and, a very, I, I like that you said that it is a very, very swingy war, which I've always, uh, more than most, uh, mm. you literally, the, the British, the Americans will win a few battles and you'll see in their correspondence and you'll see in the reports like, okay, well, we're doing really great next mm. few battles. We've got this. And then suddenly they have a catastrophic defeat. Yeah. You know, uh, and it, it, one of the big it, ones, uh, Savannah, that's one of the big ones. Savannah mm. was a big British victory. I was, you know, there were massive celebrations in London because probably if the British had lost Savannah in 1779, they mm. may have just given up and said, okay, we're done. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's, it's the same thing all the way through the British empire as well. Um, I always like to say that the Britain was Britain's the only country remains the only country who ended up with a massive empire by accident. Um, <laughs> because the, the British government, uh, it's sort of, you, you can divide the British empire up into three phases. And there's a bit of overlap as each one goes into the other. But effectively, the first stage of the British Empire is made up of we are a second-rate power in Europe. We can't expand into Europe. 
um, this is at a time when everybody is trying to expand into everywhere else, like the Spanish have taken the Netherlands of, and stuff like that. Um, and the British are looking, looking at going, well, we can't expand into Europe and no one really wants Scotland. Um, so where can we go to get a bit more money and a bit? And uh, at that point, the population's also getting a little bit big. And so they're like, well, let's go and find r random areas of these newly discovered parts of the world that virtually nobody lives in. And then we can colonize there. And e even that is largely not so much funded by the government it's largely funded by people who are fed up of the government who they don't mind being <laughs> british but they'd rather be british somewhere very far away from westminster um, <laughs> and and that's how you end up with america because america uh, the 13 colonies as again as you're probably aware set up by this whole wide diverse range of interests who are mostly concerned with either making a lot of money away from somewhere where they can be easily taxed or just getting away from Britain, uh, more specifically the government. And this kind of is the start of the first British Empire where they they end up with these massive holdings in Canada and, and the, what's going to become the USA and odd bits and pieces elsewhere, largely because they want to just colonize places that aren't Britain and occasionally also trade to make money. Mm. That phase kind of comes to an end with the, the 13 colonies uh, breaking away to become the USA. But it, it kind of segues into phase two, which is it's something of the motivation in phase one, but less so, and it becomes the main motivation in phase two, which is we want to make an awful lot of money, but we don't want to have to pay for it. Um, like maximum return on minimum investment. And so this is where you see uh, them grabbing places like uh, various Caribbean islands like Jamaica, the sugar plantations. Um, they they start setting up, at the time they call factories, but it basically uh, trade outposts and trade quarters in places like India and China and bits of Africa. Mm -hmm. But they don't actually control a massive amount of territory the only territory they're really taking to directly control is places like um, eventually Gibraltar and uh, South Africa, or at the time the Cape Colony. Those are held mainly for strategic purposes so that they have control over the choke points um, as opposed to anybody else. I mean, the, the Cape Colony, the, literally the only reason they take it is because the Dutch have a colony there and they get increasingly worried that the Dutch are going to strangle their shipping to the, the East Indies. And then eventually when they end up at war with the Dutch, they're just like, right, we're going to grab that and not give it back. Um, and the same thing with Gibraltar, actually. Gibraltar is kind of, they're happy to let it be, and Malta as well. They're happy to let them be up until they end up in a war with the Spanish. And they're like, right, well, we don't want the Spanish to close off these shipping routes, so we're going to take these and then refuse to give them back. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, so you end up with this theoretical British empire, but it's mostly a bunch of, basically trade concessions and small islands scattered all over the place, apart from Canada. And then you end up with this ever-increasing series of, of wars because everyone else is doing this as well. They're kind of trying to exploit the trade in exotic materials and goods across the world. But th th there's a, obviously there's a lot of money to be made, but a finite amount of money to be made. And so you have sort of Spanish colony, Spanish trade colonies, Dutch trade colonies, French trade colonies, and they're all setting up in places like India um, and China and Africa and these various other places. But now they're all competing with each other. And sooner or later, um, this is kind of the era of what I call the the wooden clad cyberpunk dystopia, because <laughs> you, you have all these um, companies. And like today, they'd be called megacorps. And if you look, at, if you're looking at like future cyberpunk style dystopias where the megacorps have taken over everything, this is literally happening in the late 18th century. Uh, you've got the Dutch East oh, India yeah. Company, right. the British East India Company. It's like India does not get taken over by the British. India gets taken over by the British East India Company. Um, <laughs> it's 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 like an entire subcontinent that's owned by a private entity. Uh, eventually and but it, it grows oh, out wow. of the fact that everyone is fight is kind of jockeying for position to get the best trade deal and eventually someone's like ah oh, yes but if i ally with this disaffected local prince then he might kick the other people out and then i'm the sole trader here 
And then everyone else is like, oh, but we've lost an opportunity to make money. So we're going to go and fund this other person who doesn't like that particular prince. So they're going to go to war with them. They'll defeat them because we'll give them help. And then we'll be the sole trader here. And then it kind of escalates. Um, that's uh, that's what I, I noticed that when I was reading about uh, Plassey, the mm. uh, Clives. I mean, yeah. it, it, think of that. You're right, though. It, it's like a wooden cyberpunk past. Yeah. Because Cl Clive... Yeah. Yeah, it's like Clive of India, lauded as a British hero in some quarters, actually works for the British East India Company and is largely fighting the French. The fact that he's taking over bits of India are largely to deny them to the French or French-friendly local princes and installing British-friendly princes. Um, and so this that era, that's why I say this almost an empire by accident, because the British are exploiting their superiority at sea to basically... like If everyone had left them alone and let them trade, the empire wouldn't have happened. But because everyone was trying to get one up on each other, it was kind of a, okay, well, if you're gonna if you're not going to be play nice with us, we're just going to have to kick you out. And then once we've kicked mm. you out, we might as well take your trade concession. And once we've taken all the trade concessions, then all of a sudden this is now a massive lucrative money pot and then when some of the local rulers are like, well, we want a cut of this, then it's like, oh, well, well our corporate profits are at risk. So we don't like this. So we're going to depose the local rulers and take charge because then we don't have to pay them tribute or whatever. And through this escalation, suddenly Britain wakes up at sort of 18, in the 1830s and is like, why are we in control of a quarter of the planet? Who authorized <laughs> this and how did it happen? Um, and yeah, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that one with India. I was thinking mm -hmm. about that with. Uh, uh, God, the the uh, the great uh, I don't know, if I say Persian necessarily, but the mm. great warlord Nigger Shah, like he's like your last Central Asian conqueror or whatnot. I mean, yeah. he essentially took everything out of Delhi, yeah, in the 1740s and voided taxes in his empire for I think two years. So at that point, of course, you're gonna be desperate for anybody who's willing to come trade with you. Yeah. So yeah. it's and then. Around about this is the thing, around about the 1820s, 1830s, this is when the British government gets involved. And it's up until this point, uh, the empire has been making an awful lot of money because it's run by corporate interests. And they're basically, well, as you might imagine, they're effectively asset stripping everywhere because they're interested in maximum profit and minimum expenditure. But then almost through inertia, the government's kind of like, we should probably regulate some of this. Um, we kind of ended up with this through a mixture of accident and wartime conquests, which were mainly on the basis of the uh, like the French have this thing, therefore we're going to take it away from them. And that's about as far as the reasoning went. Um, and they, they start trying to organize everything. And then the East India Company really starts to screw up in India. And the government eventually just turns around and says, no, we're taking your shiny toy away. Because um, even with our completely laissez-faire, distracted way of running things, even we think you've gone too far. Um, so they, <laughs> they just take India away from the British East India Company. And then they're like, ah, yes, but now that means we've got to run the blasted place. Well, this is going to be irritating. Um, but and but then the public and the government in general starts to get this idea of well we we've we've taken over all these places and surely we've taken over all these places for some reason like this can't possibly have actually happened by accident and then you start to get this idea of we are the superior people and we have a duty to uplift everybody and then all of a sudden this is now justification to go out and take all these other places that actually have nothing to do with making any money or anything it's literally just a case of well this is an unoccupied piece of territory um that could benefit from some from some civilizing we'll take that um and then think about exploiting it later and so over the middle of the 19th century the empire gradually shifts from massive amounts of money coming into britain to very significant amounts of money going out of britain but yeah. the overall economic in the overall like because of the industrial revolution britain's economy is going up so much that it can afford to be hemorrhaging money to sustain the empire um and yeah so by the end of the 19th century you end up with this third phase of the british empire like with a scramble for africa and everything where they're actively going out to grab places simply for the sake of it um or to deny them to other people uh, other european countries um, like, like you have like Cecil Rhodes' vision of this uh, 
British controlled spine all the way up Africa. And it's l partially it's based on he wants Britain to be the greatest country on the planet, but also partly because he just doesn't want the Germans or the French to have those places. Um, that's where you get, that, where you get that, that, that great comic of him or that drawing where it's his like he has one foot on one end of Africa and yeah. on the other end. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because Brit Britain at that point, they've got like they've got Egypt, they've got South Africa, and they've got Kenya, and he's kind of trying to draw the dots, join the dots. So this is why what's now Zimbabwe at the time, Rhodesia, is called Rhodesia because basically Rhodes single handedly ends up acquiring yeah. it again, or even weirdly enough, even even at that stage against the will of the British <laughs> government. Because the government's just like, no, it it's costing us a fortune to maintain these African colonies. We don't want any more. Um, oh yeah, but what's it? I mean, Gladstone would find himself getting dragged into these colonial conflicts he want to be involved in, like uh, what, like uh, with uh, Gordon, for instance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it was it, the the government was constantly being dragged into things, but then they're like, oh well, now we've got it. I suppose we've got to like maintain it and fix it and yeah. and, and civilize it. And you say, so, I say, so you end up at the end at the end of it all with by the end of the 19th century, Britain is actively acquiring colonial possessions in one way, shape, or form or another. And this is where people get the perception, I think, of the, the imperialist British going out there to seize everything in the name of queen and country, when in fact that's probably the, 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 least, um, the least economically viable stage of the empire, where it's all very jingoistic and rule Britannia and everything. Um, but it's a... I'd read a few books about the British Empire, and that really mm. struck me was money going out. Because, you know, at first, like you said, like very, very profit driven. I mean, not mm. the British, but you know, I read a bit about the Dutch East India Company because I'm really interested in the, uh, the wreck of the Batavia. And yeah. so, you know, you're reading about the Dutch East India Company's practices, and you're like, this is a ruthless, ruthless company, all very mm -hmm. profit driven. And then by the time you get to Africa, yeah, you're grabbing pieces of land that don't really get you a lot of money. Um, yeah. At this point, it's nationalism and pride and imperialism, and you're not really making a lot of money. So, a lot, a lot, a lot of books around the British Empire say that uh, as Britain's internal economy starts to slow down, now the empire is a full burden. Yeah, and, and this is this is the thing because it because an awful lot of its <clears throat> its development, the money and wealth generated by its its um, development, especially with the Industrial Revolution, is being thrown into the endless pit that is things like running india um yeah and so the interesting thing is that by about by the early to mid 1900s of 1905 to 1910 when the dreadnought race is kicking off a lot of people in britain have actually recognized this because they're looking at the economic rise of the united states and germany and they're sitting there going how the heck are these guys expanding so quickly and or out beginning to outpace us economically when we've got such a massive lead on them. And they begin to twig to the fact it's it's not that Germany and the USA have more money than them, because the British still at that point are, still have a lot more money, but th they're able to effectively reinvest all of their money in their own economies, practically speaking, whereas Britain is trying to prop up an empire. Yeah, and there's also the uh, the uh, the how do I say like the American skepticism of the British Empire. And one little thing that interests me, I like picking up on, you know, when I'm reading about a certain president or whatnot, is the um, longevity of Anglophobia in America until the Second World War, really. Yeah. Uh, so there was, there was a, there, uh, there, uh, while the U.S. Navy between the wars planned mostly for Japan, it would have seemed mm. to me that the one they, their, their backup, if you will, was war with Britain. Yeah, yeah, war uh, plan yeah, red. As as, <laughs> yeah, as far as the planning goes. What was the one for France? Is that wartime blue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Case, Ger Germany was black. Um, Germany's black. Okay. Yeah. In case you fight with France, we have another plan for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm unfortunately going to have to go soon because uh, no I got to get lunch. Yeah. I can imagine we've, we've gone a fair bit over. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. That, a great conversation. Thank you a lot for telling yeah. the stuff of the British Empire. Lessons learned from that. And I believe you mentioned um, at some point that you have a book either out or due to be out or possibly both. Yeah, yeah, I have the uh, Battle of Petersburg, which doesn't deal with naval matters in particular, mm -hmm. uh, that was published years back. I have two books that are supposed to be published this year, one on the Bermuda Hunter campaign, which involves a lot of the Navy, and mm -hmm. then, of course, Beauregard, who himself was an advocate, like we said, for torpedo boats and submarines. Both those are delayed by the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. 
my main thing I'm working on right now is on Shiloh and also a smaller book on Fort Henry and Donaldson. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So maybe two books. Navy's very important in that as well. Um, and beyond that, I also write for the uh, write some episodes for the YouTube channel Forgotten Battles. So that's what I'm up to. Okay. Cool. I, I, I'm I'm a subs- I'm subscribed to Forgotten Battles, so uh, that's always good to know. Um, we'll have a we'll have a, have a we'll have Mons Grappus coming up real soon. <laughs> oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, do, do, is there a release date on those latter two books, or is it just sort of on hiatus until? You know, the, 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 the two that I have, I mean, they're done. I've actually, I literally looked at the proof of the Bermuda 100 book, and it was going mm-hmm. to be published. I mean, it's going to go into the printer two weeks before they said it can't. And that's because uh, those books rely a lot on sales at the national parks. The national parks said all sales are frozen this year. Right. Uh, which I've actually heard means they're running out of stock because people are going to the national parks a lot right now mm-hmm. because they can't do anything else. Uh, yeah. So the parks are actually <laughs> rather. So hopefully they're going to say like, okay, we'll buy some books next year and then Bermuda hundred will come out right away. So I think sometime next year for both books, uh, mm-hmm. okay. Shiloh, uh, that that's a few years off, but it's, it's going to be a good one. I'm putting a lot of work mm-hmm. into this one. Well, what I'll do is um, I'll put a link in the video description for the book you've got out at the moment. And um, well, as and when you we have a release date for the other two, let me know, and I'll I'll let pop those into an announcement at uh, at the relevant point when they're close to release in the future. Oh, certainly. So um, yeah, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, obviously, there's probably going to be a lot of editing going into this one because we had a complete separate conversation afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> What do you want to do with that? Just make it like a bonus thing or something? I, I, um, I tend to love, I tend to love tangents, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I might split out some. Uh, to be honest, I might split out some of it for um, a separate video, especially the stuff about the the sort of American Navy immediately before and after the Civil War, because I'm trying okay. to put together. A, I'm trying to put together a body of 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 recordings for the American Civil War, and that'll probably sit quite nicely in a kind of a, a an, an okay. overall look over. This is kind of this is where it sat in contact with the rest of the world. Um, so I think that'll work pretty well. Um, All right. So, yeah. Okay. So th- thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And I hope to see you again in another video. And then I hit. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.